what are some of the types of social engineering attacks that we've seen? So you've seen all the traditional attacks, right? You've seen the impersonation, tailgating. Tailgating is still a problem today, right? We haven't fixed that problem yet. Uh, shoulder surfing, dumpster diving, and then some of the stuff we see more today, right? The fishing, fishing, smishing, anything that ends with ing, basically. Um, and then, you know, I did my own little branding here. I, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, it, it is, yeah. I'll push on my connection system, see if that helps at all. I got a lot of connections up here. Oh, crap, what did that just do? That didn't help it at all. <sighs> Sorry about that. Well, if you could see that, that would say, you know, it's my special branding for what we're going to expect in the future. And um, you're seeing some of this already. Um, one of the things is social media impersonation. So we're seeing the bad guys are out there. They're creating Twitter accounts. And, um, you know, you go to a company, maybe you experience some poor customer service, and you're in the lineup for an hour, and you tweet to them. You say, hey, this is no good. I really don't like this. You get a tweet back from who you think is them, uh, and they say, hey, no problem. Uh, just send us your uh, account name, and we'll give you a credit. And so they start harvesting your credentials. Uh, so they're really setting up fake accounts in, in anticipation to, to, to get that customer service interaction. Um, software as a service uh, for SE. Everybody else is doing it. You can get dial of service attacks now as a service. So we're really going to start to see that ramp up, I would expect, on the private side. We see that already uh, on the nation state side. You've seen the 50 Cent Army in China and, and every other country really gravitating in that direction. And you know, I think you'll see that more and more in the private space as well. Uh, virtual kidnapping, so where your accounts get taken over, uh, and there could be various ways to monetize that. Uh, maybe they're just going to hold you for ransom. One of the areas that I think you're, we're really going to see huge developments is whaling. And the reason I say that is because this is, these attacks now have moved from, you know, it's cool to do this, I can tell my friends I did it. Now it's monetized. It's big business now, right? So who holds the money? Well, your executives, right? So they have the authority to transfer large sums of money. So there are going to be really bigger targets, and I think there'll be a lot more effort put into that. So what's the origin story for this social engineering stuff, right? It's, it's, it didn't just occur. It's not a new thing. I'm pretty sure the people who built the pyramids, you know, I think they were pretty good at social engineering. Um, if you want to crash course in social engineering, just walk on a used car lot and, and wait and see what happens. And that experience is, is pretty interesting, right? Um, you'll have someone come up to you and they'll go through this certain script and it won't be, oh, what kind of car would you like to buy? It'll really be how much money do you have to spend, right? And so it's, it's a very interesting approach. They're not concerned about giving you the best car. They want to extract as much funds, as much money out of you as possible and give you the least value in most cases. I love doing that. I love talking to those guys. <laughs> so why should we care about social engineering? What's the big deal? So read the this chart's taken right out of it. That's really distracting. I'm glad I'm not looking at that. <laughs> Come on. I got to give you something. Hello. Okay, don't touch it. <laughs> All right. So, please stay like that. Uh, so, yeah, the Ryzen report. So this is a chart, and I like to look at charts, and I think of charts as stocks, basically. And I extrapolated this. This is not what it's really going to look like over several years, but just for visibility, you know, if we take a look at this, uh, social engineering, right, that's the super hot stock right now. If this was a stock, you'd want to buy it. Uh, we compare that to some other things, right? We see that the physical, right, uh, that's doing pretty good. Probably an ETF, maybe not a big dividend, right? But, you know, it's still not bad, not as good as social. You know, and then malware, uh, that's probably bonds. It's leveled off a little bit. And then what they refer to as hacking, I don't remember the definition, it's kind of generic. That's the stock that your friend recommended, which is never a good idea, right? So you just look at that, and vendors are saying, well, it's going up by 20%. Uh, whatever that percentage is, you can just eyeball that, and you can say, well, that's pretty steep, right? And when, whatever attacks you're looking at, most of them have started off, at least, as a social engineering attack, whether it be phishing or vishing or whatever it was, right? So it's in usually, and especially the OSINT, is usually that first stage of an attack. If you see people looking at all your stuff, doing OSINT, well, that next step is probably going to be something a little more serious. 
So that's why we should care. The OSI model, I always like to poke fun at the OSI model. Any of you have done an exam lately, you're probably pretty familiar with this. We don't typically look at it on a day-to-day -day level, but the interesting thing is it only focuses on the technical, right? So the joke is, let's add that user layer on top of that, because I'm not going to spend a ton of time trying to hack your firewall if all I have to do is phone your user base and say, hey, what's your password? And they will give it to me, right? So five minutes later. All right. So Kevin Mitnick, I had the pleasure of meeting him in Vegas this year. Amazing person. His books are fantastic. Uh, you know, he had this great quote, the weakest link in the security chain is the human element. Um, I believe in that personally, after my experience. Is there anybody in the room, or do, do you all feel that maybe that's not the case? Do you think that maybe social engineering is, is really not that big of a deal, not that big of a threat? Are we drinking the Kool-Aid? Yeah? Okay. Do you want to do a quick demo to see if you could be social engineered? Yeah, yeah it's worth the time, two minutes? Okay. So let's do a trick real quick. This is a cheap trick. You will not like me afterwards, especially if I trick you. So, you know, full disclosure. Okay, so let's do something real quick. Let's pretend we're a company. We're all working in some big company. We're awesome. We're making widgets. And uh, I'm the InfoSec person. It's just one of me, so I'm just full out. And uh, I got to do some policy on stuff you shouldn't be doing. So my executive said, they're sick and tired of you doing this thing. Like, let's say uh, something easy, like, let's say hand flipping, right? You're not allowed to hand flip. Hand flip is a fireable offense, okay? Everybody got that? Don't flip your hands, okay? Don't do that. I was gonna do something like dancing, but I don't think any of you are gonna wanna dance, so. Uh, so no hand flipping, that's the rule, it's in policy, okay? You've all read the policy, of course, right? Because everybody reads all the policies, okay? So let's do this, all right? And I need full participation for this, okay? Let's uh, put your hands out in front of you like zombies. Yeah, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Okay, so we're gonna start with our hands up. Okay, busted. <laughs> See, I told you, I told you it was a cheap trick, but that's basically how social engineering works, right? Like you're told not to do something, and then I kind of put you in this weird position, uh, you know, where you, where you do it, right? Maybe not the best example, but it just kind of shows that everybody can be socially engineered. Everybody ends up clicking on that link, and those emails are not even that good yet. Wait till they're good, right? They're getting better, for sure, so I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry about that. Everybody has that different look at this point in the presentation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that idea I ripped off from somebody. So if anybody remembers where I got that idea from, I've tweaked it a little bit. I think I've made it better, but let me know because I have no idea where that's from. Uh, so if you still doubt the power of social engineering, just go Google it, right? Most, of, most attacks start at that place, either OSINT or full-on SE. All right, so a little bit about DEF CON. Who's been to DEF CON? Holy smokes, okay, who, who wants to go to DEF CON? Okay, good, I was really hoping there'd be as many hands on the second round there, good. Okay, so I've been to DEF CON twice, first year I went there, uh, you know, you buy your ticket for Black Hat if you're going through a company, and you get, get kind of DEF CON on the side, and you avoid the lineup, and it's kind of like, you know, when I first did that, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go to Black Hat, and then, oh yeah, maybe I'll go to DEF CON. So I, I, I went there the first year, and you come out of Black Hat, and it's, you know, you, you wake up, you go have breakfast, you go to some talks, you have a lunch, you go to some talks, you go out and party, and then you just rinse and repeat, right? DEF CON is not like that. They don't have lunch, right? So no one's holding your hand, no one's going, oh, this way, sir, right? It's really, you just do whatever you want to do. There's talks, you can go out in the desert and shoot guns. There's the villages, CTFs, there's whatever you want to do. So it's really whatever you want to make of it. People call it a conference. I don't think it's really a conference anymore. I think it's a series of conferences. Uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, you know, I got the feeling when I was there, it's more like Burning Man than, than a conference, right? If you read the 10 principles of Burning Man, you kind of understand what I'm talking about. But definitely worth your time. It's a couple hundred bucks, uh, great value. But it's whatever you make of it. I brought a guy from work this year. He went there, different experience, because he didn't really know what to expect, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So if you're gonna go, kind of plan what you wanna do. Uh, so I saw the SE Village when I was there. I spent a few minutes at every, every little station, at every CTF or every village, and I went in there and saw these people phoning these companies, phoning actual companies, getting points. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I'd love to do that. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll apply for that, right? That's gonna be my plan of attack for this year. I'm gonna apply. But hundreds of people apply. 
So how am I going to get in there? Well, and there, these, the people that apply are really skilled. There's a lot of talented people at DEF CON. How am I going to get in there? So I thought, well, okay, I'll make an interesting video, right? And like everybody, life gets in the way. I didn't have a lot of time. So I made a video. I don't know if I'd call it interesting. It was really creepy. You can go and watch it. It's not great. It's just really spooky, crazy, weird. Uh, but I, get, I guess that's what they were looking for because they said, yeah, Rob, come on in. So that was good for about five minutes. I was pretty excited. And then I realized, holy crap, I'm going to be in a room in front of hundreds of people for 20 minutes, and I have to perform. So goodbye weekends, weekends and evenings. I spent about 100 hours prepping for this, which sounds ridiculous, and I guess it was. It was quite addictive. Uh, I was a total novice, so some of the areas for me that burned a lot of time was how do I collect data, how do I store data, how do I organize this data? Because if you have a thousand data points and you're trying to make sense of that and you're not really used to doing that, it takes a bit of time to do that. So, so that was interesting. I learned a, a, a ton. So if you want to learn, if you want to go take a course or something and, and get a crash course in any of these areas, things like this uh, at these conferences, the CTFs are a great way to do that. I can't emphasize that enough. So the CTF is basically two stages. Uh, you have your first stage, which is three weeks at home in your pajamas doing OSINT. There's 16 people that get to participate. So 16 competitors, and you start following them on Twitter, looking at what they're doing. Uh, everybody has their own targets, what's well, a real company, and it's part of a common industry. So this year it was the gaming industry, and uh, which was cool because I have some of the games of the company that I targeted, which made me feel a little bit weird, but, but it was all right. I got to know them really well. Uh, you have 29 flags to capture and work different points depending on the quality of the flag. So what's your SSID is worth more than, oh, how long have you been working for the company? Uh, no engagement, so you're allowed to phone the company, but I'm not allowed to talk to them. So I just can confirm the phone number works. And that's really prepping me for stage two, which is your 20 minutes uh, vishing live at DEF CON. Um, and there's, that goes over two days. So you're going to either get it a Friday or Saturday. And the winner really is the one that captures the most flags or the most points, hence CTF. So you can get the same points that you collected during the OSINT, and you, but for the vision, you can get it multiple times, depending on how many people you phone. So if I phone person A and get all the flags, I can then do the same thing on person B, not person, not number, letter. Uh, but anyway, so you can repeat it over and over again. And some people just go for the big flags, like please go to this website, and they just keep doing that over and over again. All right, this is the flags. I don't expect you to be able to read that. Uh, but basically, um, there's things like, you know, do you have a cafeteria? What's your VPN? Uh, janitorial service, OS, tenure, how long have you worked there for? So those are some of the common ones. Then starting my OSINT, because it's a corporation, uh, LinkedIn was your, my friend, right? It's just amazing how much you can just collect from that alone. Um, for individuals, you want to go a little bit differently, but since my target was corporate, great starting point, because not only is it very well laid out, but they've given me uh, some really key indicators, right? Tenure, uh, what they specialize in, uh, what department they're in. So you can start to kind of group those departments. Uh, I had multiple offices and locations, so I could find out what location these people were in. Uh, then also there's links to their other social media, which is great too. I don't even have to go hunting for it, right? It's all there. With LinkedIn, if you send me an invite on LinkedIn and say, hey, Rob, can you join my LinkedIn? I will accept. Why? Because it just expands my search range, right, which is, which is fantastic. LinkedIn will try to make you buy a membership at some point um, and you, as you limit out your search capabilities on there. Uh, and you could do that. I was determined not to do that. So there's a tool called LinkedIn X-Ray, which is a great tool, and it will allow you to kind of search the whole area, get much wider results without having to pay. So I'd highly recommend you take a look at that. So once you're going through the company, you're going to get a lot of people that you could go deep on. Uh, kind of the 80-20 rule, of course, about 20% of those people are going to be the social butterflies that are going to put everything out on the internet, right? They're going to be putting your VPN information out there. Uh, so really, I focused on those people. And also their friends, because they go out with their friends, and their friends takes pictures of, of their stuff, right, of their laptop and things like that. So really focusing on that. Going to their personal websites, which were just fantastic. They'd have their resume, uh, you know, home, home address, 
uh, cell phone number, uh, what technologies they use. So that was really, really helpful as well. So you don't want to look at everybody because that'll just burn way too much time. So I was a novice when I started this. I'm, you know, I still classify myself as a novice compared to many of you. But so when I was out there doing my OSINT, hunting these people, uh, on LinkedIn, you know, when someone looks at your profile, you, you wonder, who was that? Why are they looking at my profile? So then you go and look at their profile. Well, if you do that to a few hundred people, uh, they all start looking at your profile. So I, I noticed that after about a week into it, and at which, which point it was too late. So then I was like, oh dear, that could go really bad, right? Because all they have to do is say, hey, did uh, Rob Sell look at your profile? And yeah, he looked at mine too. And then, you know, it could be game over there. So many of you probably already have some of these solutions in place. If you're doing this professionally, there's a lot of options to give you a little more privacy. Uh, but yeah, don't make the mistake that I made. All right, so pretext development. And um, pretext is really kind of your story that you're going with. So um, to develop those, uh, talking to a lot of people over beers. Hey, would you believe me if I did this or said this? So I, I got rid of a lot of pretext through that because at first you're like, okay, I'm sneaky. I'm gonna have a really sophisticated pretext, right? It's gonna have all these bells and whistles. And no, get rid of those, right? Just super simple, as simple as possible. Uh, I started talking to receptionists. Receptionists are golden for this, right? Because they probably have kids, so they're used to you know, that sort of stuff. They're used to saying no very politely. They're usually super professional because they deal with cold calls all day long, right? And uh, so they were fantastic. I spent hours talking to receptionists. You know, at the end, I was so happy. I was buying them chocolate just for all their help. And, and really, your receptionists are, are kind of your firewall to your organization, right, as far as SE attacks. So um, I was really happy to develop those relationships even more. But uh, a lot of my pretexts were vetted through them. And um, when I went to Vegas, they, they, you know, the, they really helped me to make sure that I had ones that worked. So, um, so then you're going to Vegas. Uh, and if you haven't been to DEF CON before, some, some ideas you might want to think about. I choose not to stay in the hotel that's hosting DEF CON this year. It was Caesars. They just changed. I can't imagine, you know, people that are showing up to Vegas, you know, the, the sweet couple, you know, in their, in their 60s, they come in. And they don't know that there's three security conventions going on at that time. And they've got their laptop with them. You know, I just feel so bad. I actually talked to one couple. I said, hey, by the way, you may not want to get on the Wi-Fi. They're like, why? And then I started to tell them, and they just kind of slowly moved away from me. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I tried, right? So, you know, just you may want to figure out where you're going to stay. There's the three conferences, right, B-Sides. Um, Black Hat and, and DEF CON, and you might want to go to all three or, or one, and, but you got to figure out where you're going to stay, so that's always a challenge. Comfortable shoes, so Vegas is brutal that way, right? I was doing 10,000 at least, sometimes towards 20,000 steps per day, because uh, everything is through the casino, right? So bathroom, food, whatever you want to do is through the casino. So you're doing a lot, a lot of walking. Famous DEF CON rule, right? So three hours of sleep, two meals a day, and one shower. You know, it's a room like this, but even more packed sometimes. So there's a level of stinkiness involved sometimes. So they ask you to do the hygiene part of it. Um, so how did I prioritize my marks, right? And this is an important part, right? You're going to have a lot of people to choose from. When you're there, I only had 20 minutes. And real attackers are going to think pretty similar to this, right? Uh, they, have a, they have a business that they're running, so they don't want to waste time, right? They're, they have uh, a lot of things to do. They want to get points. They want to score, right? So same with me. So I took a look, and I developed kind of an algorithm for my marks. I wanted, like, low connection scores on LinkedIn because that was going to tell me that this person's not really well connected. They probably don't know a lot of people in their organization, and they probably don't know the industry that well either. So they're not going to be able to uh, go tell somebody, hey, this weird guy's calling me. Um, very easily, right? So that's what I'm looking for. They're not going to know what uh, normal looks like, probably, right? So this seems kind of weird. They're, they may not detect that. Then the next thing is I'm looking for people that will actually talk to me, because it's no good if I phone you and you're not going to tell anybody, but you're also not going to talk to me. So I need somebody who is expressive. So those, if you're taking a lot of selfies and stuff like that, you know, I'm going after you. Uh, and, and your ability to share. So if you've posted the VPN configuration on your Facebook, then yeah, I'm putting your name down on my list, right? So basically high charisma, low wisdom scores, which actually quite often translates into interns and contractors. And 
Um, you know, I think that it's part of the transient, transient nature of their business. Um, but, uh, but that's pretty much who I was targeting. That's what the room looks like. And I just thought I'd show you this in case you're planning to do this. Uh, it's really exciting being in the booth. And when you're in there, like any high pressure situation, uh, you realize that sophistication and complexity is your enemy. And it, you just kind of dumb down things down. It's like, okay, this, this is simple and it's gonna work. And I highly recommend that sort of strategy. Uh, and you'll see attackers do that too, right? Their, their attacks are pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Uh, in the booth, the clock's the enemy, right? So as you're dialing, uh, that takes time. Voicemail takes time. No answers take time. So that killed 10 minutes of my time right off the bat. And so I, sh I fell down in my sure bets, which was reception. So I, there was a couple different offices, uh, reception at both of them. So I spent my time talking to them. Um, some other people had more sophisticated pretexts where they would talk for a couple minutes to introduce themselves and to talk about why they needed your information. And those were doomed to failure because it gives the, uh, the mark more time to think about it, right? Does this, is this sounding normal? Is this weird? Uh, should I ask questions, right? So I find good attacks are, are quick and concise and direct uh, and believable, right? So you want to have something that, that sounds legit, but don't waste any time on any fluff, right? You want to really boil it down. Um, some, some of the general rules, right, so pictures were okay, but no video because they were worried about the audio. You, in the state of Nevada, you have to actually tell the person on the other side of the phone that you're recording, and that really would have kind of given it all away. And even though the booth is soundproof, um, you know, you can actually hear the audience, so they try to make you stay quiet until it's over. And then if you do really well, everybody jumps up and screams and yells and shouts, which is pretty cool. So now we're going to get into some of the more interesting stuff, um, some of the tricks that I used, and some of the tricks you'll see attackers use. Uh, the spirit of the SCCTF is really to not victimize the person. So a lot of my tricks were really focused on the good side, right? The uh, you know making people feel good as I'm tricking them, as opposed to the more aggressive intimidation approaches that you'll see real attackers using. Um, I think they could do better if they use some of the softer approaches actually, but they, I think for them it's more of a time thing. So the first one is the confirmation. If I know you're using Dell laptops based on my OSINT, I'm not going to ask you if you're using them. I want to build that rapport by saying, well, how do you like them, right? And then in your mind you're saying, well, okay, he knows I have them, so that kind of legitimizes our conversation. So that'll help that whole conversation wheel start turning. If I don't know, and I use this uh, technique and it worked, it could go wrong, so you have to be a bit careful, but you could do the, the reverse confirmation. So I say, oh, so you're using Dells, are you? Uh, but you're using Lenovo's. So some people will take great pride in correcting you, right? Which is great. So, no, 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 we're using Lenovo's, right? Okay, good, thank you, check. Um, you know, name dropping, I've used this and this worked. Um, real attackers don't really use this one too much yet for vish in vishing, but I think they will. So, oh, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, uh, your VP of HR recommended I talk to you. Uh, if I know who that person is, I know their title, it sounds legitimate. If the rest of my story sounds good, you're probably going to go for it. Blowing smoke, um, this one as well works great. And I use that as well. You know, you were recommended to us, right? And, you know, you feel special as soon as someone says those words, right? Me? Oh, yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I do have some good information for you. So, you know, and that they're, you're making the person feel good. Some more tricks. Uh, impending doom. And so this sounds negative. I used this trick. It worked. Um, and it's really, I, I used this HVAC example where I said, you know, we've won the RFP. And Larry's going to come on site tomorrow to do an inspection of your HVAC. Hey, I just want to call and see if there's anything we need to do. Uh, to get him set up to do that. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? So, yeah, don't you know? Like, we were working with the property management company. He's going to be there tomorrow. And can he use your cafeteria? How about your washroom? Does he need to get, use a card to get in? Hey, can he use your Wi-Fi to upgrade the firmware as well? Right? So you can start going in those directions. And for things like physical pen testing, this might be a good intro. Uh, allowed to vent. Everybody likes to vent, right? And um, so this can work pretty well. Uh, you know, my boss is yelling at me. He wants me to get this done. You know, can you help me out? And sometimes if you can get them to vent a little bit, you can start to develop, to develop that relationship. Smarty pants, you know, how did you ever figure this out? Oh, thanks so much. This works great too. I try to work this in 
to every pretext, right? To really thank them, to be very courteous. People tend to respect that a lot, I find. Uh, zero sum, aka greed. Uh, this is used by the bad guys quite a bit, right? You've probably seen this quite a bit. Very Usually it's a time sensitive thing. So somebody's gonna get this thing of value. It might as well be you. So, you know, quick, click the link, right? Uh, giving you that pressure. We did a phishing program and we found the time sensitive ones worked actually quite well. It triggers people to take action. So whatever you can do to get them to stop thinking about it, right? Just do it, you know? Uh, sympathy, uh, this works great as well. Real attackers don't use this very much, but I think they should. You know, I'm new at this, you know, can you help me out? You know, I've been trying to do this. It's my first day on the job. My boss is gonna be so mad if I screw this up, right? Who's not gonna help that person, right? Um, and I find so that works quite well as well. So now we're getting to my pretexts. And so these pretexts use a lot of those tricks. Um, and because a lot of times you'll get stuck at reception if you don't have the people's DIDs, direct inward dial. Um, and so I anticipated getting caught up in reception, and I did. Um, not because I didn't have their DIDs, I did. I took all of that out of their PBX. Um, but, uh, but it was good. You're, gonna, you're probably gonna hit reception, and, and, and there are masters at detecting uh, BS, right? So I wanted to really make sure I was ready for them. So these were designed to kind of get through that front door. Um, you know, so spoofing the university or college that some of their employees go to, uh, their interns specifically, um, calling in a reception saying, hey, can I talk to so-and-so, he's your intern, I'm calling him from the U of whatever, and, uh, you know, we really want to talk to that person to help develop our intern program. Sounds legit, right? Uh, so then once you're in, the receptionist has probably said, oh, it's the U of whatever, they'd like to talk to you. That builds some legitimacy, right? And then I introduce myself as that. And then I go through my questions, boom, 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 boom. And then at the end, I ask them, hey, can you transfer me to so-and-so? Because they're also a former student or an intern as well, right? So now I'm inside, and now I'm getting routed through without having to go back out and come back in. The blue collar disco, so I really like this. If you have any knowledge of areas kind of outside of yours, for me, I work with data centers quite a bit historically, so I know a little bit about HVAC. So to be able to talk that language and say, you know, this is where Larry's going to come in and do the servicing, I can talk about HVACs, right? And, uh, and the person on the other end, you know, it sounds legitimate to them, right? So if you can throw out those industry words, uh, that really helps as well. I did this one in Vegas and it worked pretty well. Some targeted methods, right? So these are the pretexts where you're going after uh, a very important piece of information uh, which is probably going to set off some red flags if you're not extremely careful. Mitnick does this really well. You know, if you read some of his books, he talks about how he layers, right? He goes after the first one, and it's relatively easy. It's relatively benign. It's something that you would look at and go, why would he need that information? But then you use that for the next call, and then you use the content you got from that call for the next call, and you're just building this snowball of knowledge, right? Uh, and then when you get to the, you know, let's say the fifth or sixth call, you've got tons of information to make you sound like an authority or an internal person. So that's what this is all about. So the first one was the enemy of my enemy. You know, so I'm calling as a potential tenant and I'm asking you, hey, how is it working in your building? Uh, what's the property management like? And they're gonna start to tell you about the different things within their building. And there's a ton of information out there if you wanna learn about a property. Um, to take that approach. Uh, it's surprising how much is available. Special delivery, I used this one. It worked pretty well. The script for, say, FedEx or any of the couriers is pretty well known. Um, and so you can get the receptionist to talk to you a little bit um, with that sort of call. Uh, can I tell you a secret? Uh, everybody likes secrets, right? I've never ran into anybody who said no to this question. Uh, so I'm calling as a recruiter. My company's gonna lay off some people. And I'm trying to find a new home for them, and I, you know, I'm just trying to help them out. And so I'm calling companies like yours because they'd like to, you know, work at a company like yours. And I just need to answer, you know, answer a couple questions they have, like, you know, how's your cafeteria, you know, stuff like that. Um, they usually get a bonus for recruiting, and so they're probably thinking about that. So this question is usually pretty exciting for them because you're going to give them qualified candidates. Um, so this is another good one, right? It's that that greed emotion, or greed factor. The full dumps, um, these are great. Uh, if you can get somebody lined up to do this, right, you're gonna go in. The radio station contest, I mean, any sort of contest, it's so overused now, real attackers gravitate towards this. 
You know, how many times do you get the call on your cell phone, congratulations, you won a cruise, right? It's, uh, so I didn't use that one. It was on my list, but I, you know, it's just so overused. The upgrade opportunity, so many of you probably work with vendors, right? When you have a new uh, account rep, how does that work, right? Somebody just calls you out of the blue and says, hey, I'm your new account rep, how you doing? Right? There's no real formal approach to that quite often. So if I phone in and I say, hey, I'm your Dell account rep, I know you have Dells, I know what models you have, right? I can call in and sound pretty, le pretty legit, go through, hey, I want to send you some free demos. How's that sound? That sounds pretty good, right? I just need to know, hey, how is it, how's it working out with uh, your VPN client? Right? So I can start digging, get a little bit of content that way. Um, you're so special. The engagement survey, I used this one. This one worked really well and it's really fast too. Once I get the person, you know, I do some name dropping. I do that trick, hey, I'm working with the VP of HR. They gave me your name, right? And uh, they said you could help me develop this engagement survey. And uh, as soon as you get them to say yes, and I don't even, the person said yes and then I moved into the question so quickly, I barely heard it. Just, you just get that little bit of commitment and just start rolling, right? Boom, 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 boom. And they're answering questions as quickly as they can. And um, so that's, that's a really good one for a lot of content. The final one there, okay, you caught me. A lot of people say, well, if you get questioned, you should never drop your pretext. The joke is even when you're going into the police car with the handcuffs on, you should always stay in pretext. And uh, I kind of didn't want to do that. I wanted to put a twist on that a little bit. So it never happened. I was really wishing it would happen. Hopefully in the future it will where they say, hey, you know what, like, Rob, I'm not really buying this. I, I don't think you're my Dell account rep. This actually happened in Vegas to somebody else and it was hilarious because they knew the person they were impersonating. It's like, I don't think that's you. Uh, and they were arguing for about five minutes. No, it's me, it's me. It's like, okay, where do you live? And it just went downhill, but it was, it was hilarious. So, so my pretext was, okay, you know what? Congratulations, you caught me. You're the only one in this whole company that caught me. Right? I'm going to give your name to the executive and because you're an example of the type of employee that they need to have. So, you know, I'm making a note of that. And uh, hey, if you've got a minute, can I just roll through the rest of these questions just to develop a baseline? So, <laughs> so you know, I've made them feel good, right? Nobody's victimized. Well, they kind of are, but they feel good about it, right? So I'm just kind of like flipping it over and just keep on rolling. So I thought that might be more effective. So I, was, I really want to try that in the future. Now, this is the reflective moment. Uh, that I promised you, okay? Uh, some questions to ask yourself. You don't have to say this out loud because some of these might be uncomfortable. Uh, you know, would you know when your staff, especially your exec, have been socially engineered, right? Uh, you know, some executives will come to you and say, hey, yeah, I've been emailing this bad guy back and forth and, uh, you know, they think that's funny. Uh, other executives may not say anything because of embarrassment or, or something like that. So do you have a mechanism to trigger that uh, feedback to you, right? Because you probably want to know sooner than later. Um, how bad would it be if your CFO transferred, you know, millions of dollars? There's companies out there that have wire transferred $50 million, right, or m more. I remember the one $50 million, which is, seems like a lot of money, right? I would be in a lot of trouble if I transferred $50 million from my bank account, if there was that much in there. Um, so, um, you know, so that's, that could be embarrassing. Um, does your insurance cover that, right? Uh, that would be interesting to take a look at. If you give away your money, are you insured, right? Um, do you have the internal resources to manage that risk, right? So if that was to happen, what would you do? Would you start doing some sort of forensics on that to figure out what exactly happened? Would you have visibility? Would your InfoSec staff have the skills to do that? And then finally, you know, can you navigate the Equifax paradox? What I mean by that is, Who's getting fired, right? So, and if you don't know the answer to that question, it's probably you. <laughs> so, uh, it's good to know that. All right, so some recommendations. Uh, understand your exposure, first of all, right? So, OSINT yourself, that's always fun. Uh, OSINT your company, find those social butterflies. So, who are, who are the people that are publishing your VPN information out there? That, that's probably a good thing to take a look at. What's at risk, right? Is it uh, proprietary information? Is it source code? Is it big buckets of money, right? So what are you protecting? Um, these attacks are monetized, so at the end of the day, they wanna make money. 
So build up some defenses against phishing. Uh, some things you can do, you can do a phishing program. Everybody's doing this these days. Uh, you want to measure the clicks, but I would also say you probably want to take a look at how people are reporting it as well. I did a phishing program. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it looked really cool, and I was a novice, and I released all the emails at the same time, so everybody got it at the same time. Don't do that, because people got it, and they're like, oh, cool, what's this, right? And they're clicking on it, which they're not supposed to do, just to see the splash screen. Then they're telling their friend to click on it, right? So just don't do that. Um, and I didn't measure reporting, which would be a good metric to have, right? How many people are actually telling you they got this, this weird email? Uh, you can create an EXT tag on your incoming mail that's coming in from the outside. So when the president gets, the, or when, the, when the, actually the, the CFO gets the email from the president that says, hey, can you wire transfer 50 million to that other company over there? It's an emergency. But they see the EXT and they realize that, oh, maybe it's not the president, right? Because that's coming from the outside in. Uh, you won't do this, but you know you could stop allowing active links in the email, so they actually have to copy and paste, and they would actually see that okay, it's it's not going to Amazon.com, um, and then provide some other channels other than email, right? And we're starting to do this quite a bit. We're realizing that we're overloaded with emails, right? And the amount of time you can spend reading any particular email is probably seconds, right? So um, some other channels, there, and there's so many of them. Uh, defense against vishing, right? So. Your executives are the, the highest target, the, the, the big value target, right? So if you could vish them, ask their permission first, be very sensitive, uh, use that as a learning opportunity, but tread lightly, right? They may not find this as entertaining as you. Uh, create choke points. So I talked about the receptionists a little bit, and really, they do such a wonderful job of protecting our business. And, and do they ever get any infosec training or awareness training other than to say the, the annual click through stuff, right? So that might be an opportunity. On your PBX, you probably have dial by name. Do you still need it? I love that feature because I can go in there at night and I can get everybody's number. I can get everybody's title and then I go to their voicemail and I listen to their voicemail. I get so much information. Do you need it? Probably not. Maybe your sales department needs it. Maybe your marketing needs it. But your IT department and other people that probably not, right? I don't want it. Uh, DIDs, you direct into our dials. Most of your staff does not need DIDs. Um, give them extensions. Have it routed through reception. They're probably calling out a lot or, or some, but they're not getting a lot of inward calls, right? So why have that? And don't match your DIDs with your extensions either. Um, that's, that's not very good. Uh, stop answering the phone. I got in trouble for, have, for putting this bullet point on there, right? So take that with a grain of salt. That's one of my opinions. Um, you know, if you recognize the name and it's your boss, you probably want to pick up the phone. I did this, this talk internally and a lot of managers looked really badly at me, so I had to put that in brackets there. Always answer if it's your boss. Uh, get on the offensive, right? So I write a lot of policies that nobody reads. And um, and we do the annual training uh, as well, the awareness training, and the joke is how fast can you get that done, right? Uh, nobody's reading policy, and it, you know you have to have it, so I'm not saying don't have it, but a majority of people are not reading them, right? Um, when you fire somebody, you point to it, right? But instead, I'm saying we need to create a, a culture change, right, of continual challenges. So take those people that are doing the right thing and, and make them into heroes, communicate, okay, we're doing this, this goal. So InfoSec is doing this, advertise that, right? We don't have to be the bad guys. We can say, hey, we're doing this, this is exciting, you can be part of this. Give stuff away, give out Starbucks cards, right? Be the good guy, uh, right? You'll get so much popularity just by giving out Starbucks cards, put people's picture on, on your SharePoint or your Confluence site and say, hey, this person did this, it was fantastic, that's really what we should be doing. And then ultimately, we wanna get to culture change, right? So. One of the problems we often complain about is, oh, the bad guys only have to get lucky once, or, you know, I don't have budget to really make a difference and to protect all the things I need to protect. Yeah, that's, that's, that may be true, right? But, and we can't scale. If we don't scale, we can't, we can't really win that, that war, right? So if all our employees care about security, and we always say they should, but they, they don't, right? They're not rewarded on that, so they won't, right? Um, we have to reward them, and we, we're not, at this point, uh, putting that on their yearly review, right? That's not one of their goals necessarily. Hopefully one day it will be. But we can do other things, right? We can make them into heroes. And, uh, and then you can, based on that, you can scale. You can make them into mentors, right? 
so that then they're teaching on your behalf. All right, some of the tools that I looked at, and you look at this, it's like, well, Rob, I use those tools every day. Yeah, it's, it's really how you use them and then what your target is using, right? So you kind of roll down this list, LinkedIn, if it's a corporate target, that's where I would start. Use X-Ray, it'll help you out a lot to bypass the pay service. Twitter is great for images, uh, very fast, you can do that. You can do tools like all my, all my tweets to get everything all at once. Uh, Instagram, if you want to do geolocation, it's not bad. There's better tools out there uh, where you can fence off an area, set a time, and then get multiple, um, multiple channels of, of that. So there's, uh, what's the one? there's another tool out there for emergency management. I can't think of it right now, but if you're curious, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Uh, Facebook's not bad. SlideShare, surprisingly good, right? I don't know why, but people put their reference letters on SlideShare, uh, and that gives you tons of information. Personal websites are golden. Job postings, I can learn all about, you know, your Cisco firewall that you have and, you know, what you're hiring people to look after, right? Just go through that. Google Maps, you can get your picture of the building, entry points, stuff like that. Uh, signage, sometimes you can read that, which is very nice. Uh, if you're going to do physical pen testing, that's a good starting point. And then once you're through that, uh, move into the more specialized, right? So. Uh, you know, your, your wearables, Strava is great, I can see where you ran, Shodan, IoT, right? Uh, Pastebin, I can set up an alert on your company. Uh, Spokio, at, at an individual level, I'm going to get a ton of information from that. Uh, and then more specialized, which is even more fun, right? So I can look up people's, you know, criminal record or their taxes. Property management is a really nice area that I'm focusing on a lot lately. There's a ton of information out there for that some resources. Um, so one of the best resources is Michael Bazell's uh, in, Intel Techniques. Uh, you can go there. There's a ton of tools there. It's like this big menu system of tools. So if you want to do some OSINT on somebody or a company, just go there and it, it kind of simplifies everything for you. He's got training. He's got a podcast. Uh, tons of information. If you live up my way, uh, Toddington does something similar. He trains most of the government agencies. Uh, he's a great resource as well. Again, online training articles and stuff like that. And then, of course, the social engineer, right? Um, he really is the one that organizes this SECTF, both at DEF CON and Derby now. Um, so he's got tons of information, great podcasts as well. If you've got some money, you can buy Pluralsight um, if, with your company. Uh, Cyberry is a free resource online as well, and they've got lots of great tools. I'm a big fan of them. All right, so I rocked through that pretty quickly. Um, if you've got questions, we can do that now. Uh, I just want to tell you this is my uh, latest project here. My, it's kind of an OSINT project, so if, you're have, if you have any uh, interest in OSINT, you can take a look at that and let me know what you think. Always looking for feedback on that. If you want to reach me, those are the, the ways you can do so now. Twitter's your best bet. So we've got a few minutes. Questions? Yeah, at the very back. Yeah, so I didn't cover that, but that's one of the places where I started, uh, you know, just doing a who is. There's a lot of good tools out there uh, that provide information on that. Uh, I like to look at who registered the domain, and then I look at the IPs, go on to error and, and look at who owns those IPs. That's great as well. That'll tell you a lot of good information. I got emails. I got phone numbers. And the phone number's nice because even if you get the pretext, that helps you with the bank of numbers because then you know at least I've got that far right and then it's narrowing down the suffix of those phone numbers so definitely want to look at that yes sir <laughs> yeah it's yeah 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 I, I I don't really need that right like if you gave me someone's name or a company's name all, all you need then is time there's so much out there Right, it's it's uh, you know it's it's amazing how much is out there, so just need time and you can start gathering everything. Yeah, so I'm sure there's a lot of good tools out there. Unfortunately, I'm not using any of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, if somebody has recommendations on that, I'd love to hear that because that burned a lot of my time and I'm still struggling with that. So right now, I use Excel. Right? People use Excel for everything they probably shouldn't. 
uh, including myself. So I would have links within Excel to, the, to these different channels, um, and then I could sort and stuff like that in Excel, so that's why I used that. And I knew how to use it, so, but I wouldn't recommend it. Yes, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw people use that, and I think that's very effective. Um, you know, the the joke is, you know, people put their their they're going on holiday on Facebook, and then their house gets robbed. Right? Same idea. Uh, my out of office. I'm very careful with that. I simply say that I'm not available. Uh, that could mean anything. But as an attacker, the minute you see that, you could then you know, you could leverage that for sure. So the, I don't like to put a lot of detail in that. If I say I'm in Hawaii, then they'll use that, right? Oh, hey, yeah, I'm calling because Rob's in Hawaii. I said, he said I should give you a call to, to get this. So for sure, that's a good technique. Yes? Uh, so it wasn't on Facebook, it was on Twitter. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there was, there was myself and there was another person who talked about that, uh, where they found it on Twitter. And uh, I don't know what people are, are thinking. I think that that's, you know, as we do our, our self-promotion with these social media channels and we build a brand as an, as an individual, we have to be a bit careful about uh, what we're putting out there, right? So we're proud of the companies we work for and we want to talk about the companies we work for. But I, I don't think it's appropriate to uh, to post their VPN configuration. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, that, that, that's a really interesting area, right? Is where do you draw the line with this self promotion and branding, right? So it's uh, VPN was definitely across the line. So, yeah, I, I recommend go out and take a look at that, right? See if any of your employees have done that. That's one example of things they probably don't want to do, and then you can build awareness around that. So, yes, sir. Yeah, so all of the information is uh, open source, and so you put references to all the information that you collected. So you have links to it. So one of the bits of uh, one of the bits of evidence that I found was a YouTube video, a tour of their office, which was incredibly useful. Yeah, so I did that frame by frame, and uh, you could see the. Uh, in the mirror, there was a reflection of somebody bringing up their badge like that. And so I screenshotted that. I had the second in the video and sent the link in for that. So, yeah, there's, yeah, that's how you do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it was about 50 pages. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, you could have gone more and more and more. And it's funny because you start going down that rabbit hole, and it's so fun, right? You're like, oh, yeah, I got this one, right? And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, you feel like a private investigator or something, right? It's a, it's a real rush, so. Almost, I, uh, I was so frustrated because there was one or two that I didn't get and it was uh, who does their garbage and who does their uh, bug extermination. And uh, I was trying, I was working so hard at that and you know, trying to get different uh, camera angles of their office, and I could see there was a truck in their parking lot. Thought, oh, maybe that's it, but I couldn't get it quite right, using all sorts of different satellite imagery. And uh, yeah, that was fun, but missed those two.